this is this is this is Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast. What's up, everybody? This week, this week coming up, if you're listening to this as it comes out, it's coming out Monday. Um, what's the date? Monday, October 15th right now. 17th. All right. It's coming out October 17th. And that means we are, we're going to be announcing slash releasing some things this week. So please. Stay tuned. If you haven't already, go check out the MXPX socials, um, our Instagram, our Facebook, whatever you're on. Go over there and check out MXPX. Get back, get back with MXPX because we are officially just busy. <laughs> I've been so busy lately. It's been insane. It has been insane. So um, MXPX.com, thank you guys. We have two shows already announced right now. Straight up, we're going to be in, in November, Friday, November 18th in Chicago at the Chicago House of Blues. Get your tickets at mxpeaks.com. And then the next night, Saturday, November 19th at the Rave in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I like to say Milwaukee. Yeah. Alice Cooper style. Um, you guys, we have more coming. We have more coming. Stay tuned. But uh, we announced that when we were Young Fest and that has everybody Twitter pated. Really, everybody's really excited. Um, I, we're excited too. You know, it's going to be a great show. It's it's a long time from now, and we got a lot of exciting things to happen before then. So, you know, maybe you missed out on tickets. I think it sold out yesterday or the other day. Uh, I don't know when it, Friday it was on sale. I think it sold out that day. Um, but who knows? I, I have I, I've seen a few people say it was sold out, and, and a few people say that. Oh, they're just on a waiting list, which means, like, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Everything's so different nowadays with ticket pricing, ticket fees, Ticketmaster, the way that everything works with Ticketmaster. Um, as a, you know, I'm kind of on both sides of the ball a little bit because we sell tickets to our shows and we do go through Ticketmaster sometimes and we go through other companies as well. But I've been on on the the consumer end as well, you know, buying tickets online, um, dealing with Ticketmaster, going to events, whether it's a Climate Pledge Arena out in Seattle, go to a lot of shows there, go to uh, the Kraken game, Seattle Kraken hockey team plays there, and I always have to deal with Ticketmaster apps and you know it's not always on the app sometimes you can get away with just going to the website but you always have to sign in and and um, go through the whole rigmarole and in some ways it's easier I guess if you do it a lot it's kind of easy but if you're like me you know I'm not always going to shows that I need to have a ticket mat like these big events have these ticket master digital tickets kind of thing um, a lot of I mean even I would say most punk shows, um, like an MXPX show, um, I would assume, see, I don't even know. I, I would assume that it, you wouldn't have to have the app on your phone. You could, you can have a physical ticket. You can have um, a, a, a screenshot of your ticket. Pot. Maybe they don't do screenshots because you can fake those so easily. Um, I guess what I'm getting at here is just everything's changing so fast that... I myself have experienced some of it uh, firsthand and then some of it I'm just kind of like you guys a lot of times wondering I wonder what this is going to be like what what's the situation with this ticket this show so I think in the future we're going to this is a big project for MXPX I mean we have a lot going on but I would really love to figure out um, figure out the ticketing situation, you know, because of the ticket fees are so crazy these days. Um, MXPX shows are still, I think, reasonable and on par with an average ticket um, in the market. Now, we have to do that to kind of compete with other, with other, not just, uh, not that we're competing with acts, I don't think of it that way, but it's, we have to be around the same price ticket-wise as, as other acts. Otherwise, it's like, okay, why are they so cheap? Is it because they're not good? So, <laughs> you know, you got to think about these things. I personally don't usually think that far into ticketing. I was just, I guess I'm thinking about it right now because of 
what's going on with the, the Blink shows too. You know, the Blink went on tour. Uh, I think they sold out their whole like regular tour package, world tour. And some of those tickets are like, well, 300 bucks for a ticket. And then, you know, you put a, a service fee of, um, you know, I don't know what that would be. You know, fit, sometimes it's up to like 40%. It's kind of insane. So you're, you're, you're almost doubling the, the, the price. Now, as I say this, I feel like <laughs> I'm not doing a good job selling my shows. You know, people aren't going to want to go to see a show after hearing me talk about crazy prices and crazy, crazy ticketing fees, you know. But <clears throat> it's, it's, it's just the reality of the situation that, that we, we have to deal with that. And, and people that go to shows have to deal with that more and more as as Ticketmaster and, and other companies, ticketing companies get integrated into the internet more and more. It's all going digital. Um, it's it's getting, like I said earlier, it, it's kind of supposed to be simp simple and it is if you use it all the time, but at first there's that steep learning curve. There's that, you know, you might be one of the percentage that, oh, your phone just glitches out and doesn't it doesn't work or something, you know, that, that happens. But um, I'm talking about these big events, you know, um, going to Seahawks games, going to Kraken games, going to big arena rock shows. I might go see the who, um, next week, actually at the end of this week, it'll be Saturday night in Seattle. Um, if I can get tickets, we'll see. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm right there with you guys. I just, I would love, uh, this, this wasn't a topic that, that somebody wrote in about or, or called in about, but. It is a topic that I think a lot of people somewhat care about. Not everybody cares. You know, there's people that make plenty of money and they don't have to worry about it. And But at the same time, you know, the ticket price is one thing. And then if you're paying a service fee on top of that, you know none of that is going to the band. It's going to the promoter. It's going to the venues, the, the live nations of the world, the ticket masters of the world. It's all being split up into a thousand pieces for the corporations. And it's making that reality is making it harder and harder for DIY bands like MXPX. I call us a mom and pop band, you know, because we have a small team. My, my parents, you know, host our merch arsenal, you know, like where we send our merch out from our merch store. It's at my parents' house. So, I mean, like very mom and pop band and, and it's getting harder and harder. Now I'm not saying this to complain because I mean, things are great with MXPX. We're, as big, if not bigger than ever at this point in our careers. We've got new music that we're, we're trying to wrap up this new album. And uh, yeah, we're planning a bunch for 2023. Um, there's more on the way. Like I said, there's a big, there's a couple big things coming. So stay tuned. Be, be, make sure you're following MXPX um, because it really does help us. I guess, I guess in a lot of the ways where, where I think what I'm talking about with the corporations and the middlemen everywhere taking their cut, um, they're making it harder and harder for bands to make money even when they own their own stuff, which is blowing my mind. It's just like, it doesn't matter what you own or what you do. If you are not part of the, the corporate club up here and you're not playing their game, they make you make less money straight up. Like you just shouldn't make as much money unless you're in our corporate group. So you know, that might lead to some corporate sponsors. You know, if you're a fan and you're listening to this podcast right now and you work for a big company, a big corporation that has anything to do with entertainment, and maybe we find a partner, you know, maybe MXPX finds a, a, a corporate partner that can push us out there, you know. Um, we're open to not just being DIY. I mean, we are DIY, don't get me wrong, but we're definitely open to partnerships. I think it's going to be different than... than the way we see partnerships right now. It's the future is going to be much different. And, and I think we're going to be forced into some of these lanes of, all right, because you're not corporate, you don't get this and you don't get this and you don't get these Spotify plays and you go to all this, you know, you don't get these, this headlining spot or whatever. So we have to like kick and scream for every spot we get. Um, as, as most bands probably do, uh, most punk bands probably do. And, you know, we're not going to quit doing that, but you know, if we could ever find, and now and again, we find people that we partner with and do cool stuff. Um, 
I, I would say shout out to Silver City right now. So Silver City Brewery has been amazing. We've been partnered with them a couple of years now doing beers every few years. And we love that. You know, it's not something that like makes them a bunch of money. It doesn't make us a bunch of money. Really, the money isn't it's 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 almost like it takes profits from them to give us to do a beer for us. But it also takes profits from us to do a beer with them. But I think it's so much more important to do cool things with people you respect. And, and in this case, Silver City is a, a local Bremerton, Washington brewery, Kitsap County brewery. And, you know, they love punk rock. They support other bands in the area. They they support the local sports scene as well. They're huge fans of the Seahawks, the Kraken, the Mariners. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a. Uh, it's something that we're open to, and so if anybody's out there, and seriously, not just like, ah, you know, whatever, but like, you know, we say no to almost everything, so don't feel bad if we say no, and I'm like asking you to hit me up, and then we're saying no right away, but we're looking for something in particular, for sure, for sure, and uh, if you got something for us, let us know. Let me know. You can write me here on the podcast. Um, my Career Podcast on Instagram, My Career Pod on Twitter, and then it's My Career Podcast on the Facebook. It's like Facebook group. You got to go find it. So just type in My Career Podcast Facebook group. Um, that's it. Let's get to these voicemails. All right. Thanks for listening to my rant. Um, I don't think we solved anything on the ticketing issue, but it's on my mind. And it's definitely something that I don't take lightly. And it's something that we do care about and think about um we care about all our fans not just not just fans that have disposable income i just want you guys to know that all right uh, let's get to these these questions we're going to do a short one today i've already talked way too long but this is my podcast so i guess this is the place to do it am i right yes thank you i appreciate you guys thanks for listening thanks for tuning in um if you haven't already subscribed please do um, and then please, like I said, go check out mxpx.com, check out mxpx on the socials. If you haven't seen us in a while, we have been posting lately. And I think, you know, we, we hadn't posted in a long time. And when you don't post on social media, the algorithm basically takes you out of people's feeds. So we might not be in your feed right now. So please go check out mxpx on whatever social media that you prefer. Um, we're everywhere, even on YouTube. So uh, that being said, let's get to the first caller. And thank you guys for your calls. If you want to call in, call me at eight, uh, sorry, three area code 360-830-6660. Leave me a voicemail. Ask me a question. Tell me a story. Whatever it is, would love to hear from you. Just get me going on a topic like ticketing, right? All right. All right, here's the first caller. Hey, Mike, this is Matt from Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, I got two questions for you. Um, first question uh, revolves around a nickname. Um, many of the female MXTX fans I knew growing up described you uh, with the term sexy mexi. Um, if you could describe essentially the origin of that nickname, when was the first time you heard it? It had been yelled out at shows um, towards you. Um, I don't know how backing that would be um second question <laughs> all right i'm gonna just pause there uh, because i don't have a good memory uh <laughs> sexy mexi yeah i haven't heard that in a long time it's pretty simple i don't know where it started i don't know who started it i do remember hearing it yelled out at shows yelled out at all sorts of shows um all over the place but um I'm half Mexican, so I'm half English, half Mexican. My dad is is full Mexican. He he was born in in Fresno uh, to Mexican nationals, I guess you could say. My grandparents were were from Mexico, so um, American. I was born in in Bremerton, Washington, here, and uh, but I've been a half and half, half and half, uh, an Oreo, you could say. Um, <laughs> That's, I don't know where, I don't know where the, I, I'm just thinking about it. I don't know where the actual nickname came from. It could have, it could have been started early, like in high school or something. But like, I probably did some sort of interview and maybe Tom called me Sexy Mexi or Yuri or something like that, you know. Um, but honestly, 
I wish I could tell you, Matt. I, I heard it, but I never knew where it started. Um, Sexy Mexi. It, San Antonio, that was the place we would always go. Uh, Houston, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Austin, Texas. Anywhere down south that had, of course, San Diego, Los Angeles, California. Uh, anywhere down south that had a Mexican or a Hispanic population um, really, really loved me in particular because my last name's Herrera. And um, I don't usually say it like that, but <laughs> it's like saying, I want some burritos, some tacos. Yeah, but, um, you know, because of my last name, it's like obviously a Mexican name. It's, it's like Smith in Mexico. It's like Mike, Michael Smith, Michael A. Smith. Um, but my name is Michael A. Herrera. And anytime we hit those southern states, um, it's I don't notice it as much nowadays because one we're playing a little bit bigger venues and um, but back in the day when we would be like right with people and people would be on us it it was it was intense and obviously it was a lot of young girls and I was a young boy and and all of that and now I'm a I'm a grown up man so I'm just doing my thing I, I try not to notice those things these days but it it has not been leveled at me lately the sexy mexi. And no, it doesn't hurt my feelings in one, one bit, in the slightest. What's your second part? I have is, how did you meet your wife, Holly? And uh, I believe I read somewhere that you proposed at a show um, and mouthed the words to her when she was there. Um, so yeah, if you could just kind of describe what was it about that night that... Uh, you wanted to ask and how did you know Holly was the one? Thanks. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll give you the short answer. No, that's not actually true. Um, I met Holly, my wife in Dallas, Texas, and she was in the crowd. I remembered her. I actually talked to her after the show. She was getting a pick for her then boyfriend. And so we didn't hang out or anything. I just, I remembered her being in the crowd. And then two nights later, she went to, her and her boyfriend were huge fans of the Ataris as well. And they went to go see the Ataris the next night, like a Friday night, or maybe it was a Saturday night. And she didn't come to Austin or wherever we were going to be. And I was like, all right, well, you know, all good, you know? And then the next night, so two nights later, she came to Houston with her boyfriend again. I think her boyfriend, boyfriend was in the fan club or something she was not a fan of mxpx she kind of knew about us but she wasn't like oh, i love mxpx i love mike you know she had you know i introduced myself and it was like meeting a new person so anyway she came to houston and i was like oh they're back and i was just like i had a you know instantaneous crush on her um yes she had a boyfriend so i just played it cool but uh that was when we met and then you know we there's more to it, of course, but m uh, months later, she broke up with her boyfriend and we started dating. And I proposed to her a little later, but um, not too much later, within a year. Uh, it was like five, six months after we met, and then, which is quick, which, I mean, geez, I mean, it, most people would have said that that wasn't going to work out. But 30 years later, here we are. No, tw third. That's MXPX. <laughs> 20 years later, here we are. <laughs> uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks for your, your, uh, your call, Matt. I appreciate it. And, and honestly, I think the reason why she said yes was because sexy Mexi, what are you going to do? Next question, next caller. Hey, Mike, it's Jerome Skews out of uh, L.A., How's it going, man? Long time fan, first time caller. I'm just wondering about George Went. Why was he in the responsibility video? Did you bring up cheers with him? What's to do with that? Also, met you guys at Bamboo West, uh, West, uh, 2007 Secret Weapon era. So you guys are really cool. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye. Jerome, thanks for your call. Dude, okay, Bamboozle was fun. Um, we played a couple different bamboozles and both both were great. The second one was huge. It was it was definitely in like the height of the emo era in New Jersey. It was just every band was there, including us. It was insane. Um, glad you liked it. Anyway, uh, George Wentz, great little story. 
his daughter was a fan of MXPX, just like these little girls, you know, a fan of MXPX, loved us. And when we didn't actually know that, <laughs> but we were, we had the idea of, okay, here's the video. It's Caddyshack meets punk rock. And we need to get a cool boss. Like, let's, who, who should we get? George Wentz. Let's, let's ask George Wentz. And because we, we had heard that he did cameo little videos sometimes. And, and he does. He, he has. He's done other people's. Um, and so anyway, he was like, man, I'm in the, I'm in a, I'm doing a play. He was doing a play in Chicago. And I can't do it. But then when he realized it was MXPX and his daughter was a fan, he's like, all right, I'm going to bring my daughter. If she can be in the video, I'll do the video. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, she's in the video. So she is actually working with us. She's like a caddy with us uh, at the very beginning of the video. And you, see, you can see her. I think that's where she's at. She might be a few other places in the video, but she's in that video. And, and uh, we got him. We got him. And he, he was so great when we were filming. He, he did a bunch of different like little vignette type things like acting little expressions he would like you know he'd do that he like he spits the guitar the cigar out of his mouth and and he's just like surprised frustrated mad all the all the emotions that a boss would get um watching his employees go crazy you know and start racing and sword fighting with with uh what do they call those golf clubs <laughs> <laughs> I used to golf, not all the time, but I used to golf. I, I got into it for a while. Um, and uh, it was back in the Creighton Burke days when he managed us. He was a golfer. And so he got me into like tournaments. Speaking of Milwaukee, by the way, we're playing Milwaukee November 19th. Um, the reason why I say Milwaukee is because I think of uh, Alice Cooper. I did the Alice Cooper pro-am tournament in vegas one year and it was actually it wasn't his tournament it was david cassidy's tournament from from the uh what's that show the the partridge family i think it's called anyway his tournament but yeah but but uh alice cooper was there and he's a great golfer and he, he plays all all these types of tournaments and stuff and there was a bunch of other people there i think I think um, there was some, I think it was uh, Adrian from No Doubt, the drummer of No Doubt, Adrian, um, was there. He's a, he was a golfer. I think he's still a golfer. Anyway, I, I never considered myself a golfer, but I got into it enough to just have a good time. And, and nowadays, every now and, then, now and again, I'll hit the links. And um, you just got to have some drinks, maybe a little smoke with you. Just have a good time. Right around 420, you know. How old am I? I don't know. <laughs> Here we go next. Uh, let's do one more call, you guys. You guys have been great. It's going to be a short episode, just mainly because I have a lot of work to do to get things ready for this week. All right, you guys, get excited. Get excited. All right, I love you, and here's the last voicemail. Hey, Mike, this is Paul Paris. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've been listening to you guys since the 90s and just wanted to first say that I really reconnected with the band over the COVID pandemic period uh, with the acoustic material that you're putting out on YouTube. For some reason, that really hit a nerve with me, resonated, and really got me back into the band a lot more than I had been. So thank you for all that. Um, thank you. questions for you. I am actually going to be traveling to Seattle quite a bit here over the next year uh, for some projects that I have in the Bothell area. And question for you is, I'm a guitar guy, and I want to know first if there's any really good vintage-type gear stores that are a must-see in the Seattle and Bothell area that you can point me to. And then the second is more of a life question. I have uh, two young daughters, uh, one's 10 and one's 5, and just wanted to get your perspective on trying to get your kids into music. Uh, my one daughter plays viola, uh, really likes it. She did pick up the guitar for about a year, but, but kind of got turned off from it. 
and just wanted to see what your approach is to, to kind of not force them to be into it, but at the same time, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's something you want to get in, into. So anyway, thanks so much. Uh, keep everything going. I think what you're doing is great, and hopefully you can come to Pittsburgh sometime too. Love to see you there. Bye. Right on. Thanks for the call, Paul. Thank you. Um, so check it out. Yeah, if you're going to be in the Seattle area a lot, there's there's probably more. There's more than what I'm going to do. I know two really solid vintage guitar shops. Um, although I know there's there's another one I can't remember. So check it out. So there's Emerald City Guitar right downtown. Unless they've moved, um, you'll have to check it. Check the address. Emerald City Guitar is always a solid so many rare things, really nice vintage amps, guitars, basses, stringed instruments, anything like that. Um, their amps, I mean, they have some one-of-a-kind setups over there. So that's always a beautiful place to walk into. And the staff is always super nice, great people. Al's Guitarville in Wood... I want to say Woodenville or like... It's like North Seattle. It's not... It's it's It's... Like, if you go up through Wallingford, up through the U District of Seattle, it's on the north side of the U District of Seattle, and it's called Al's Guitarville. And that's where I bought I bought my my one of my vintage P basses, Fender P basses, that I used to use on all the old records. Mm. I bought a couple Fender Tellies there. I bought, I bought a couple amps there. Um... Tom's bought a, a guitar or two there. Like, we used to go up there when we were recording at Robert Lang in Shoreline, Washington, which is North Seattle again. Um, we would go over there because it's kind of close. And there was another guitar shop close to Al's Guitarville-ish that, I don't know, I just remember it being sort of just this, this big glass box because it had big windows and you would just go up and it was two, a two-story guitar shop, almost like a standalone building in Seattle, in North Seattle, um, U District. Um, yeah, but th- those are the two spots, I would say. So Emerald City Guitars, Al's Guitarville. There's a bunch more, like I said. There's probably a couple more, um, but those are the ones that I've personally shopped at, bought things at, loved. Um, and everything, you know, there's there's Guitar Center now, and there's there's there used to be... Our guitar center, before Guitar Center existed, used to be called American Music. And we had an American Music in Tacoma, Washington, and American Music in Seattle. There's probably a couple in Seattle. There was one in, in the U District, and then there was one downtown. And um, that was basically kind of like if you have Sam Ashes in where, where you are, it was like a Sam Ash kind of thing or um, things like that. And those are all gone these days. But I put my first, uh, my first not, not P-Bass, but my first music man so i wanted an ernie ball music man stingray and i put it on layaway in tacoma washington at american music and that's that was my first stingray that i ever bought and and i bought it with my own money and um i bought a couple stingrays before i i started getting sponsored by ernie ball and then never had to buy a bass again but um i've bought a couple bases i guess but anyway um that was just, you know, it's just crazy. Times have changed so much. And so I, I just, I look back fondly on the days of layaway, pr- product layaway. And, and, and the fact that I, 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 I'm glad that I had to do that, you know, that I couldn't afford just to like walk in and buy a new Stingray. I mean, it was like $1,200 at the time, you know? So if you think about pr- the price of instruments, yes, they've gone up. Now um, I have my own you know, artist series Stingray. It's the uh, My Career Artist Series Stingray, and and it's I want to say it's like twenty two fifty retail price, something like that, like twenty three hundred bucks basically, and that's expensive for an instrument. Yes, absolutely. But like I went in when you know I was in high school and I mowed lawns. I did what I had to do oh, at the time. Okay, that that was post mowing lawns. I was washing dishes at Spiro's. I was working, working restaurant jobs to buy instruments and buy gear. And that was, that was the, the biggest purchase for me for sure. You know, 1200 bucks plus tax. And I never once regretted spending that money on that base. Never once. Like it's, it's, I, yeah, I still don't regret. I mean, obviously I don't regret it now, but <laughs> I'm just like, it's so funny. Like, 
all the all the things that I I would buy and scheme at like I want that amp. Oh, I got to get that amp, you know. It never makes you play better. You know, maybe it makes you sound a little bit better, but ultimately you really have to put in the work and play. Uh kids that brings us right to kids and learning how to play guitar and and what's my approach. I personally, you know, with I'll just tell you what we're doing with our kids. Um, early when they were very young, we got them toy guitars and toy drums and and I let them mess with my real guitars and stuff. And they just make noise and they have fun with it and they do their performances and I uh now we're at uh, my daughter is 9 and she's taking lessons. And she takes lessons from Jack Parker, in fact, uh, from Tumble Down. And I kind of, you know, I I get on her now and again, but I really just let her do her stuff. And then when she has questions, um, of course, I answer those questions. But um, I'll tell her, like, you know, you really got to learn your chords if you're going to write songs because you have an idea in your head and you'll want to you'll want to like figure that out on guitar and you won't be able to because you won't know the chord. So that's mostly what I tell her. And she's, she still forgets. So she doesn't practice enough, but she's getting better over time. And with uh, my boy, he's six and he doesn't have interest right now in actually learning and taking lessons, but he likes to bash on some, you know, instruments now and again, still. Um, so I just don't force it. I know eventually because he watches what I do and he'll watch. Um, and I'm not just talking about musically. He, he, he watches everything I do. So if I do something he really thinks is cool, he'll let me know. He'll be like, I watched you do that. And then I'm going to try it, you know. And, and so I think I just need to play more around him because <laughs> I don't play a lot. You know, when, we, when they were kids, uh, well, they still are kids, but when they were younger, babies, at first, they really loved it when I played and sang. And then after a while, they kind of got tired of it. And they're like, all right, please, no more. Stop. Stop playing. Stop singing. That kind of thing. And I think it's just because if I'm singing, they can't talk. You know, they have to sit there. Like, I want to talk. So it's a patience game, and it's a long game. And and I'm, I'm not advocating for them to go into the music business and to be professional artists. Uh, I would just be happy if they learned to play and had fun with it because playing is really the best part of it, honestly. Everything else is just a lot of work and, you know, you get rewarded. You know, you obviously get, you get rewarded by people coming to see your shows and giving you that, that feedback. But, you know, there's a lot of reasons to do things, you know, and, and I, I wonder why I like thinking back to when I first started thinking back to when I first got into punk rock, you know, punk rock was, was so different back then, you know, to me, I didn't know what it was. It was like this style of music that skateboarders liked, you know? And, and then as I started listening to punk rock, it was just like, Oh, it's just like stripped down angsty rock music. Right. Like, you know, um, which is true because, I mean, if you think about grunge music, grunge is like a slower, depressed punk. Um, and then you take like, you take the, the, the more uplifting vibes of punk rock and then you put like sad lyrics to that. That's, you know, and some screaming. Okay, that becomes emo. So, I mean, I've gone, uh, gone off on a little tangent here, but just thinking back to punk rock, it's like, I just... I don't mind letting them discover at their own pace without trying to help them every step of the way because there's going to be so much time. Like a good example, and I'll end with this, a good example is like my daughter's also into making videos. So directing videos, doing selfie videos, making uh, making my son do his, you know, like you're the actor, all right, and she'll film him. And she'll so she'll put videos together and she'll like, I see what she's trying to do and there's like an edit that's like messed up. And, I'm, and I used to be like, hey, fix that, fix that. You know, now I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to let her figure out that it could be better. You know, and, and that might not be this video. This video might go up onto the internet, onto her YouTube, and there's some edits that could be better. But she's, you know, maybe she won't even be doing this next week. I don't know. So, so I... 
I'm allowing and choosing to allow them to enjoy the experience of learning, the experience of not doing a good video, the experience of not knowing what those chords are that you want to figure out. Well, I guess I need to learn the chords then, you know, or, or maybe that's going to make her make up a chord that goes with her idea and, and find a new way to play. I don't know, but I think no matter what, it's going to be a good experience for her because she's going to discover, she's going to discover herself, the failures and the triumphs. And, and, and I will admit that I have been writing songs with her now and again, and, you know, I'll come up with the chords, you know, she'll come up with a lyric and come up with like the melody and I'll just come up with the chords to it. And then I'll come up with the next part of that and try to come up with the words that fit with her words. Um, you know, but at some point I feel like she's just going to take, take that and just do her own. Um, as she can play more, she can, she'll be able to actually write the songs. Now, I don't know how people do it when they can't play instruments. I know it can be done. It's done all the time. What I mean is songwriting. When you can't play an instrument, you can only like write words and sing. It can be done. Anything can be done. So whatever she ends up doing, I'll be happy about. Um, she, another cool thing is now the kids are into tennis. So I've been taking them out playing tennis. It's great exercise. It's something that I can do with them. It's something we can do in the morning and then I can go and go ahead and go to the studio, go to work, whatever it is. So uh, it's been amazing. It's been great. So uh, I know I said this was going to be a short podcast. It's almost an hour. It's not quite an hour. We got 20 minutes till an hour, but still long enough, right? All right. Thanks for your call, Paul. Appreciate it. Didn't mean to rhyme. Stop rhyming. I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? If you can tell me what movie that's from, extra VIP points for you. Let me know. <laughs> All right, Bob McKnight, the producer, the editor, the guy I send this to last minute every week. I appreciate you, my man. Check out his podcast. It's called The Bob and Katie Show. It's very funny, very quirky, and uh, I think you guys will like it. Um, what else? MXPX shows, November 18th in Chicago. Tell your friends. You might have a friend in Chicago or near the Chicago area, and they may be a fan of MXPX, and they may have no idea that we're playing in Chicago because our ads didn't work when we put out the show. Now, we still, 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 we still sold a bunch of tickets, but there is still a lot of people that don't know about the show. How can that happen simultaneously? I don't know, but it does. So Friday, November 18th, House of Blues, Chicago, and then Saturday night, November 19th, The Rave, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Both shows with Teenage Bottle Rocket, Punk Rock For You, and I mean, it's going to be a blast. You guys will not regret it. Come on out. Say what's up. Uh, we will do a meet and greet after the show. Free VIPs for you guys. Um, we don't make people pay extra to meet us. We don't make people pay extra to get our signatures. That is no dig on other bands. People got to do what they got to do to make money. We just don't have to do that to make money. We do it. We make money in other ways by like owning our own catalog and owning our own merch store. A lot of bands don't have that. So we appreciate you guys. And, and to give back, we like to do signings. And um, we're going to do it in Chicago after the set. We'll come out to the merch table or somewhere right next to the merch table. And then after the set at the rave, if we're not too scared, <laughs> we will be out there again. Um, so yeah, uh, you don't, don't have to worry about missing punk rock show. Don't worry. It takes us plenty of time to get, get over there, but just giving my listeners here on the podcast, a little heads up. If you're coming to Chicago or Milwaukee or any headlining show we do, um, I know we did miss we did miss uh, the last weekend in April. We didn't do signings, but that was because um, that was because of a, a situation. So, not a big situation, just a situation, and and so we didn't do it. But um, like a sicky situation, and so we didn't do it. And but we are gonna do it for you guys. We appreciate you, love you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Thanks for listening to MXPX. And as a reminder, please uh, sign up for the MXPX mailing list on our site or our text mailing list is great too. And we'll let you know when we're playing. We'll let you know when we have uh, a new album or a new song or something like that. Speaking of new things, make sure you check it out this week. All right. Peace out. Peace out.